9,029 search visitors a month to 449,000. That's a huge increase. Now, to clarify, I did that increase through uh, a period of two years, from January 2015 all the way to January 2017. And then after the summit's over, if you guys still have questions that I don't answer during the summit, you can always tweet at me. So here's my traffic, right? As I, you can see from the screen, January 1st, 2015, I had a bit more than 9,000 search visitors a month. Now, if you fast forward to January 2017, as you can see, this is 449,000 visitors a month in search. If you can see at the top left, you'll see that it says organic search traffic. This is not paid search traffic. This is pure organic. So experiment one, and I ran quite a few, but I'm going to talk about the seven most interesting ones. Experiment number one, does post frequency affect search traffic? Now, you guys already know that when you're first starting off with a blog or a website and you add a ton of content, of course, frequency and the amount of content as well as quality affect you know, how much search traffic you're going to get. Because if you have five pages that Google's index, and then you have 100 pages, obviously you have a higher probability of getting more search traffic. But the real question is, is, is there diminishing returns, right? One is if you go from having 100 blog posts to 200, 200 to 500, 500 to 1,000, etc. What really happens? So I decided to test a few things. I did everything from, for periods of times, I've blogged once a week only, I've blogged three times a week, I've gone all the way up to seven times a week, and even 14 times a week, that's two posts a day. I deleted the content that doesn't get 100 search visitors a month, right, after it's been live for six months, because you have to keep in mind that just because, you know, you publish a piece of post, it's not going to get search traffic right away. But over a period of, you know, six months, it should be doing somewhat well in the search engines. And I've even tested translating my blog into three different languages. In total, I have over 1,900 posts. I've tested quite a bit. So, and you can just see, right? Currently, it shows that there's 1,919 posts published. I have English, Portuguese, Brazil, uh, German, and Spanish. Those are the uh, four main languages that I'm in right now. And I have content literally on all forms of SEO, marketing. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry about that. And what I found is the more content that I produce, I was like, all right, this should help increase my search traffic, right? Well, after you reach a few hundred blog posts, this is what happens to your search traffic. And you can see this. In other words, it's pretty flat. Like, yeah, you may see certain days a bit higher than others, but if you look at it over a period of a month or two, it's pretty flat, right? In other words, the test didn't go the way I wanted. The more posts I publish, when I deleted content, and I tried all these different types of things, I was hoping that my search traffic would go up. Now, again, to emphasize, when you only have 10, 20 posts and you publish another 30, 40, 50, of course your search traffic's going to go up over time. But I'm talking about after you have enough content on your site, 100 plus posts. And what ended up happening was I didn't really get more search traffic just by publishing tons more pieces of content. But I learned something that was really interesting. I couldn't predict which posts were going to be hits or misses, which is why I published them in quantity. And I did everything from like using Ahrefs and SEMrush and seeing where my competition's getting traffic from. And I'm like, okay, you know, like maybe I should publish posts that are just like my competitors. I even did stuff like going into my analytics for my own company, such as Kissmetrics seeing what posts are popular, and try to replicate better versions on neilpatel.com to see if that also helped, right? Tested a lot of things. And what I found is it was really hard to replicate success by just publishing a lot of content and using intelligence from competitors and data like that. But I learned that when you publish posts, and there's no real logic behind this, but when you publish posts, just randomly some do well in search engines and some don't. And when you look at your analytics, you'll see like me, like number 20 on this page, right, in that chart is 13 secrets that will boost your Facebook organic reach. That was a post that I published in 2015 that naturally just started getting traction. 
I didn't do anything. I didn't build any links to that page. It didn't get necessarily more social shares than some of my other posts, right? I've had posts that got on three, four, or 5,000 social shares, and they didn't get as many uh, search visitors as the posts that got 500 social shares. There wasn't really one specific pattern. And I couldn't predict when I write a page, even if I like put the right keywords in there and everything like that, that I'm going to get high rankings. But what I found is that when you publish content and you do it in mass scale, some of your posts just naturally get good search traffic. So as I showed on that number 17 or number 20 listing, that post has 4,159. And what I started doing is I went go into Google Webmaster Tools, I clicked on search traffic, then I clicked on search analysis, right? When I did that, I would get a listing and here's what the tick boxes look like when I'm in uh, Google Webmaster Tools. So once you log in and you click on that, you'll get this report. Make sure you click on clicks and pages because that filters based on pages and it shows you which ones have the most clicks and you'll start seeing a list. Now here's the Facebook one. This is a more recent screenshot so there's way more traffic. It's number four on this. Uh, 10,000 and keep in mind Google Webmaster Tools data never matches up with analytics. Webmaster Tools always reports less than Google Analytics from everything that I've seen. Um, for neilpatel.com it ranges quite a bit. Some months it's off by 1.3, some months it's off by 1.6 which is quite a bit. So once you click on a page, so I clicked on the number four listing, then you want to make sure you tick these boxes. Clicks, impressions, queries, right? And then you'll get a list like this that'll show all the keywords that what's your impression count and what's your rankings. That'll tell you what you should try to get more rankings for. In other words, what you should try, what keywords you should be trying to rank higher for. And then from there, I would use Brian Dean's skyscraper technique. Um, Brian Dean spoke earlier in this event. If you're not familiar with the skyscraper technique, just Google it. And it's all about creating a page that's more in depth and more thorough than every other one in the space and has more content and more details, etc. So I made my Facebook page more thorough. That didn't really increase rankings, but I did outreach to everyone in the social media space and asking them for backlinks, right? And when I did that, over time, that page increased in search traffic. It went up from 4,000 to 17,000 visitors. So the big thing that I learned from this experiment was publish a lot of content. Don't expect to get more search traffic just because you publish a lot of search content. I mean, just because you publish a lot of content. But that'll help you determine which posts are naturally going to be hits. You can start deleting the ones that don't even get 100 search visitors a month. After six months or a year, you pick whatever you want. And then from there, Take the most popular posts using the method I described within Google Webmaster Tools, find the keywords, go build links using Brian Dean's skyscraper technique, and you wait like four, five, six months, your search traffic on those pages will drastically increase. And Google likes something about those pages. It could be click-through rate, it could be uh, user metrics like good time on site, low bounce rates, etc. And those are the pages that you really want to tweak and fine tune. So experiment number two, here's another way that I really increase my search traffic. Um, it's pretty much to figure out if you can use social media data to figure out how to increase your click-through rate. We all know that click-through rate increases rankings, right? So if you're number one versus number two versus number three, there's a huge difference in how much search traffic you get. You, of course, want to be number one. And when you're number two and you're getting more clicks on your listing than the number one listing, what happens? Well, Google will naturally move you up. Why? Because if all the users click on the second listing, it tells them that, hey, the first listing isn't as relevant as the second one, so they should switch them around. And that's what Google does. So the key is, how can you create really attractive title tags? And you guys have seen some of this stuff out there. Um, I know Moz, Ram Fishkin, did an experiment. He tweeted out saying, hey, you know, I currently rank number seven for IMEC Lab. Can everyone go and click on that listing? Within three hours, he shot up to number one, and still to this day, he ranks number one. And this is what Rand did, right? He tweeted out, care to help with my Google theory slash test? 
Could you search for IMEC Lab in Google and click the link on my blog? I have a hunch, right? And that was in April 2014. Worked well. So let's go over how most people increase their click-through rate. And you guys may have heard me talk about this in the past, and this is what I used to do. It works, but it's a pain in the butt. So I would sign into Google Search or sign up for Google Search Console if you already have it. Let it sit for 30 days so you can collect a lot of search data. Then log in, select your site, click on search traffic, and then click on search analysis. And you'll get a report that looks something like this, right? It pretty much just shows all the keywords that you're getting traffic from, uh, the amount of clicks, the impressions, etc. And then, you know, you can click on the following boxes. Clicks, impressions, CTR. And make sure you're still on queries. What it'll do is show you the total number of clicks, impressions, and average CTR. Then it'll look for keywords that have less than a 4% CTR, right? Such as key terms like online marketing. And then what I would do is I would take the pages that have those keywords and the page that's ranking, and I would do a few things with my title tag to increase my click through rate, such as I would test using numbers and negative words. I would also try using the words what is within the title tag, because I found that like if you put, let's say, what is online marketing? What are protein bars? Do protein bars work? Things like that. Do protein bars make you stronger, right? I found that those get a lot of clicks. I also uh, tested things like including the keywords in the front. I also looked at pay-per-click ads for ideas. I would use SEMrush to also type in my competitors to see what ads they've run in the past um, to just go see and you know get all the keyword ideas and ad copy ideas because you know Google AdWords is largely based on click-through rates, right? Just because someone bids more doesn't mean that they're going to be on top. If, they, if someone has a highest click-through rate by far, they're usually going to be the highest listing, which means that their copy is really appealing. I also would test out different uh, word counts within title tag. I found six words work really well. I tried using power words and adjectives, which work as well. And of course, evoking curiosity. So here's examples of adjectives, effortless, fun, incredible, essential, strain, absolute, etc. Right? These are all keywords that I've tried within title tags and variations of these. So here's an example of a really good title tag, and this one evokes curiosity. This one's by Authority Nutrition. 10 proven benefits of green tea. Number three is very impressive. What's number three? Like, I wanna know what number three is. You click, and then it goes from there, right? So, once you start adjusting your title tags, you'll notice something like this. And I used to do this with my nutrition site, which I don't have anymore, but sold it. And uh, I would get clicks, keep adjusting the title tags, I would use Google Search Console, and over time it would go up. It was a pain in the butt. It wasn't a 100% uh, success rate. Sometimes I would fail, and then I had to keep retesting the page, and it could take me months, because it takes Google a long time to show data, right? It would take literally a month for me to figure out if the new title tag I'm using is working. So. You know, the other thing that I've learned throughout this whole process when I was using Google Search Console, I learned phrases like what is, best, amazing, list within your title tag, how to, free, the word you, tips, why, tricks, great, and even putting the year within title tags, right, these are all phrases and words that work extremely well to increase your click-through rate. But again, this process would take me at least 30 days to figure out if it was working or not. So there must be a better way to optimize click-through rate, right? And that's what my whole experiment was. Can I get results quicker? So what I started doing is using Twitter. Now, I have a lot of followers. If you don't, you can also try using Google AdWords. You can also buy Twitter ads. Uh, you can use tools like adding a lot of Twitter followers and then unfollow the people that don't follow you back. It works. Once you get enough followers, like a few thousand, five, ten thousand, or you're willing to uh, pay for a few bit of ads, you'll quickly be able to tweet out a lot of stuff and figure out what's working and what's not. So if you notice with me and my Twitter account, my guys tweet out, I kid you not, 10 plus times a day. People think we're crazy and we're just after the traffic, and that's one portion, but what they don't realize is we're using Twitter to try different title tags for the same links to figure out which ones are getting the most retweets and likes and click-throughs because that's telling us what's the most appealing titles that we could be using. 
Because if the picture's the same, and we're testing stuff out roughly at the same time of day, and we have data on what time of day our users are the most engaged, then we know that, hey, the title affects everything. So we would test out doing things like changing up the title tag. So as you can see, the one at the top says, five steps to creating a profitable Facebook advertising campaign. I may also test out how to create a Facebook average, uh, how to create a profitable Facebook advertising campaign, right? Another variation could be how to create a profitable Facebook advertising campaign for less than $500, right? And I'll test out all these methods, figure out the click through, and then if I had to adjust the copy to match the headline later on, I would, but by doing that, over time, my search traffic went up. And it didn't go up right away, but over time, it slowly kept going up. And that's what you'll learn with click through rate. In which, when you test something out on click throughs, it takes Google some time to figure out where they should place you. So if your click through rate continually increases, they're not just going to move you from number 10 or page 3 to number 1 on page 1. They slowly move you up, and that's why you start seeing a gradual increase in search traffic. And that's what I was seeing when I continually tested my click-through rate, and I realized that Google Search Console is a slow way of doing it. Just do it through social media. So experiment number three. Who is Neil Patel? Some of you guys have seen this. Some of you haven't. And my big hypothesis with this test was, does Google rank brands higher? And I wanted to really figure that out, right? Just like Pepsi, Coke, everyone knows about them. You see that glass, you're like, ah, oh, I want a Pepsi. I want a Coke. They have a really strong brand. So do these brands get preferential treatment when it comes to Google? And well, first of all, before you can actually do that, you need to first figure out, how does Google track if a brand is popular? You would assume based off of search volume, right? Well, for you, because they're not going to reveal all of that data, right in the same format that they get the closest and the easiest thing is google trends so you can type into google trends any name any company and it'll show you a chart if there is no data that means your brand's pretty much non-existent in the eyes of google and over time as that increases it'll go up and you see spikes in my name and that's fine that happens when you get pr or big press and i wanted to see if i can manufacture the quote-unquote spikes. And I did. These spikes aren't natural. It's all caused by me. So here's my search traffic before I started doing brand campaigns and after. Um, and as, as you can see, that's a huge increase. 24.10% increase in search traffic, all from increasing brand queries. And I've done it multiple times over you know last few years, and it's worked extremely well. So I did a few things. One, I had some friends who are really popular on social media. They tend to be models. I don't know why they're the most popular people on social media, on like Instagram, but they just are, and they don't make a ton. So they're also willing to do things like signs. So one of my buddies, Dan, and his partner, um, I don't know why I'm uh, blank on his name. What's Dan's partner's name? Brandon. So Dan and Brandon run a social media marketing company. And Dan and uh, Brandon, they were like, oh, we can get a ton of people to search for you. So I was talking to Brandon, and we were talking on Skype. His son was just like, who's that guy you're talking to? Who is this Neil Patel? And it came to us. We're like, oh, we should just do the campaign call it Who is Neil Patel to see if we can get a ton of people searching. So we had models, both females and males, and even makeup artists and a lot of random people do crazy stuff with my name, Neil Patel, or who is Neil Patel, to see if we can get way more search volume. So as you can see, picture of a model. I also had a really buff dude. This was my favorite. He deleted it after a while. It was a video. The guy was jacked. He probably was like 250, 300 pounds. I don't know, like a big, bulky, muscle builder type of guy. And on his chest, he put Neil Patel, and he was like flexing his chest, and then my name would keep going up and down, and you create like a video, and you put it on uh, Instagram. And it worked out extremely well, right? So much so that, as you can see, my search traffic just skyrocketed. And I did a few things. I had them do it always on the same day. So at first, I tried doing this in which I had everyone do it throughout a month. And I realized, even if someone's really popular on social media, like let's say Instagram, and people post something, no one really searches. It doesn't really help. But 
if everyone is talking about you or your company on the same day, and I would do every Tuesdays, I just picked a random day, I found that your search volume skyrockets because everyone's on social media that day is continually seeing you, and they're like, what the heck, why is everyone talking about this person? There must be something big there. And then boom, your search traffic just skyrockets. Right? And it takes usually a few months to kick in, but you'll start seeing your brand queries go up. And it works for almost any industry. Here's one from Shreds. Um, they had a lot of bad press because people found out their people doing Shreds stuff, the supplement stuff were taking steroids. But nonetheless, they grew into a company that was doing $20 million a year purely off of social media. Um, you know, and they paid men, women, fitness people, uh, you know, mothers with family, whoever it may be to promote shreds. Uh, here's another example, Gary Vaynerchuk. This is a cool way to get more people talking about him. He started putting out ads within uh, New York City with his cell phone number. Great way to create press as well. And you can try anything. Um, you can manufacture it like I did through social media. Focus on crazy marketing tactics. You can also use performance-based press companies like Chris from PRServe.com. He's pay-per-play. Uh, there's another one called Dan from uh, Stranger Social in which he leverages uh, social media like Facebook, Instagram, and he get people who are really popular who don't make much money to do stuff for hundreds of dollars. Uh, and just get creative with your ads, right? Test a lot of stuff out, but this stuff works. I've done it. I've tried it. And I've done it so many times, and I've done it in Brazil and the U.S. and Spanish markets, and uh, it's really helped grow the business. So here's some lessons I've learned. You want to run your campaigns all at once, uh, which means that you want to do them, let's say, all on a Tuesday or all on a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Monday, pick a day or a Friday. And you want to consistently do this over a period of two months. After you stop, you'll notice that your search traffic is still way higher than it was before. Rotate up your campaigns. Don't just use the same influencers. Keep rotating them up. And don't expect to get results right away. It literally takes a few months to kick in. So experiment number four. Is content really king? And it's funny, right? Everyone talks about like, oh, you should do a ton of stuff with content. Blogging is the best stuff. And is it really the best stuff, right? I have no idea. I thought it was the best idea, but... And I, because I've been blogging for so long, right? Quick Sprout, Neil Patel, Kiss Metrics, Crazy, etc. I'm like, well, let's really actually see if content is king. So, I invest so much time and energy into content because I have a team that helps me. Like, I'll do a lot of the writing. I have people who edit. I have people who are correcting it. I have people who put it up into WordPress because I write in Microsoft Word. Don't ask me. I don't like writing in Google Docs, and I don't like writing in. Uh, WordPress, I don't know why, but I've been writing in Word for so many years, so I'm just used to it. And I'm like, if I look at how much I spend on content a year, it's hundreds and thousands of dollars. Like with designers helping make things look good, from customized images, I'm like, this is actually really expensive. And of course it can be done cheaper, but I'm strapped for time, right? So I decided to create a tool, the SEO Analyzer. And I created this landing page, I spent money on a tool. Um, this tool, I don't know what it ended up costing me. My guess is around like 20, 30 grand. I could be wrong. I went a bit above and beyond. You don't have to go that crazy. And you know, here's a screenshot of what the tool looks like. It talks about your SEO score, your page speed, etc. And here's the traffic to the tool over time. Right? As you can see, it's climbing. And best of all, I didn't build any links to this tool. I didn't really do anything. And this isn't the only tool that I've done this with. It's worked really well. People love tools. The time on site is really high. You can see the average time on site is only 1 minute 11 seconds. But this is just for the tool home page. If you go look at the stats for the tool page itself, there's over 4 page views per visitor. And the time on site is well over 2 minutes. Exit rate is low. Bounce rate's not too bad. Overall, pretty healthy. And as you can see, it continually goes up. It's so effective. Here's an example of the tool traffic over a 30-day period. Just the home page, and almost all of it comes from Google, right? As you can see, my most popular page is my home page, then my blog page, and then my tool page. That's how effective tools are. You should definitely create tools. One of the most popular pages and one of my best investments by far. And for additional proof, keep in mind Google Search Console data is always different than Google Analytics, but 
Google Search Console shows more people find my site from the tool page than any other page. It even beats out my home page. This is pure Google traffic. That's how effective a tool is. Spend your time, money, effort creating tools. It's the best ROI and it's not just me. Right? HubSpot, they have an email signature generator. I was talking with one of their guys, Ryan in Australia, and he was like, yeah, our email signature generator generates as high quality leads for our sales team as the content itself, and it's way cheaper. And I'm like, seriously? He's just like, yeah, he's like, just from that tool alone, we can get over 10,000 uh, leads a month. He's like, it's amazing, and it's way cheaper than doing content. So it's not just me who's doing this. This kind of stuff works even better in B2C. Like all the tips I'm giving you today, they work in both B2B and B2C. They work for personal brands and corporate brands. And if you look at HubSpot, they're continually building more and more tools, right? Their email signature uh, tool, their website grader. They're continually adding more and more to their suite so that way they can capture leads at a much cheaper cost or even capture sales at a much cheaper cost than creating content. So experiment five, does bounce rate impact search traffic? We've all heard about it. And, you know, there's a few things that I uh, ended up doing. I think the slide is wrong, right? So is this right? Uh, let's see. I'm just fast forwarding. All right. Bit misplaced, but I can go through it. All right. So in general, you've heard about it. And I started testing things out. And here's the general synopsis. I improved my load time by roughly 31%. I compressed my images. I removed uh, the entry pop-up, not the exit pop-up. I know people are saying like Google's penalizing for mobile pop-ups. All my buddies who are running mobile pop-ups and even me, we haven't seen any difference in our search traffic, just as a FYI. Uh, I increased the text size on my blog to make it more readable. Made my paragraphs shorter. Improved the design of the, I improved the design of the mobile uh, version, right, the responsive mobile design, and I pushed the content above the fold. So out of all the changes that I made uh, that reduced the bounce rate, the entry pop-up and adjusting the content so it's more above the fold helped more than anything else. And I would test this out per region. You don't have to do it per region. I have a lot of devs that work for me. Um, but when you landed on a blog post page, this was the part above the fold, right? And now when you go to a blog post page, you actually see the title first, and then you see a screenshot that's related to the title, so this is a screenshot of Google AdWords, and then you see text underneath. And that took my bounce rate from June 2015. This is just for Google USA traffic. I created a filter. This is just search traffic in uh, United States of America. And as you can see, my bounce rate was 85.70%. So 13,000 visits from Google, just USA, 85,000 uh, or 85% 85 bounce rate. And then November 2015, I got up to 23,000 visits a month from Google, USA, right, United States. Bounce rate decreased to 72.9. So in essence, the bounce rate went from 85.70% to 72.19%. And overall, the traffic increase. The pages from Google almost doubled, 22,383 to 40,933. And it's so funny because everyone talks about like, oh yeah, we know bounce rates and user metrics, you know, of impact rankings. Like, tell me something new, Neil. Well, how many of you have actually tested that out? I bet you not even 1%, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Even I'm slow to test a lot of this stuff out. But test, some of these things that you continually hear about, they really do help increase rankings. It just takes time. You decrease your bounce rate right away, you don't get a huge lift in search traffic. But over time, as your user metrics continually improve, Google places you a bit higher, and they still see if your better user metrics still stick. And if they do, they place you a bit higher. And if they still stick, again, your rankings keep going up. So why do they do this? They do it because they don't want people spam or just creating sites popping up to the top of Google and then spamming the crap out of it and then making a ton of money off of shady stuff. That's why it takes a lot longer to get rankings. Plus, it also encourages more people to just spend money on AdWords. So experiment number six. Does keyword density or thoroughness matter more? So I'm assuming you guys have all tried shoving keywords onto a page. I know I have. 
I used to do things like aim for a higher keyword density than my competitors, use keywords within my H1 tag, use the keyword within my URL, and put the keyword within the first sentence of the content. So I would use a SEO Books keyword density tool. The URL is there on the screen tools at seobook.com slash general slash keyword dash density. Uh, if you don't want to write down the URL, no worries. This is recorded. Or you can just Google SEO Book keyword density. And here's an example of a page. This is on how to uh, start a blog. And as you can see, I don't care about keyword density. Right, it went all the way from 873, which is my most popular key term, which is reply, uh, then Neil, then Patel, then Neil Patel, reply to, because I get a lot of comments, right? And I tested out the density and tried doing different things like removing comments and stuff. And I improved the density overall, so that way more keywords are on the page, like bloggers, domain, WordPress, blogging, blog, blogging platform, uh, etc. types of bloggers whatever it may be. And what ended up happening was my rankings, can you guess what happened when I adjusted the density? They didn't do much. They didn't really change at all. And I even gave it time, like 30 days, 45 days, right? But when they made the content more thorough, it moved from page three to page two, right? And now I'm ranking a middle of page one, I mean middle of page two, and I expect to be ranking on page one, it's just a question of time. So here's what I mean by thoroughness. That page that I tested this on is called how to start a blog. You can see here in the URL, neilpatel.com slash how dash to dash start dash a dash blog. So neilpatel.com slash how to start a blog. And that post just pretty much breaks down how you can build a blog using WordPress. And I started making the page more thorough by doing things like covering all aspects of blogging, like how to start a blog, how to write your first blog post, how to promote a blog post. Um, I even started poking holes and doing things like talking about every single blogging platform because I'm like, wait, I'm only covering WordPress. What if someone wants to start a blogger blog or a medium blog or a blog using Wix, etc. I also looked at all my competitors and see what they were covering using the SEO uh, book keyword density tool and I didn't look just at keyword density I looked at all the words that are mentioning and then I look at all my competitors who are also on the first page so the first 10 listings and I also looked at all the keywords they were mentioning to see if there was any commonalities I did a lot of this in spreadsheets it was a pain in the butt but it worked well and that helped me rank higher and if you go to that page now you'll see that I cover every single blogging platform. It's more thorough. It doesn't have the best keyword density compared to the competition, but it's caused my rankings to increase and it's continually gone up and hopefully one day I get high up on page one. So experiment number seven, do URLs really matter? So I changed my URL and in one month, my search traffic grew by 40%. Uh, Tyler from uh, Canada who was giving a speech, I think yesterday, He's the one who told me about this. Uh, we got introduced by a mutual friend, Tony from Expedia. And Tyler's like, oh, dude, I can improve the on-page SEO and improve semantics. And I already knew about a lot of the stuff he was going to do. And he's like, dude, URL can really change your ranking. And I've heard that so many times. But I didn't want to go and have my devs do a 301 because I was like, all right, I'll probably get like a 2% lift, a 5% lift, which I didn't care for. But he was like, no, you'll get a huge lift. I tested this a lot. So I'm like, what do you want? Because I don't believe anyone should ever do work for free. So he's like 20,000 Canadian. So literally that night, went back to the hotel room after doing the networking event. Without a contract, I just PayPal'd him 20,000 Canadian dollars. And he tried to give me a lot of changes. I was like, all right, whatever, right? Um, and a lot of the changes I knew weren't going to impact my ranking, but I'm like, all right, let's make this URL change. So here's my search traffic in December 2016 before the URL change. Right? This one thing that he taught me brought more attention to because I was like, all right, yes, everyone says URLs matter, but how much could they really matter? There's over 200 factors in Google's algorithm. Well, my rankings went, and my search traffic went from 283 to 449, literally in one month. All because of removing the dates in the URL. So what was the URL change? I went from neopatel.com slash year slash month slash day to post title to 
neilpatel.com slash blog slash post title. Now this comes down to semantics relevance. When Google reads this URL structure, this is my old one, this is the post title. Let's think about the post title. It works in a hierarchical fashion, right? So what is this telling Google? This is telling Google that the post title is related to a specific day. And that day is related to a specific month. And that month is related to a year. And that year is related to a blog. Well, my posts aren't related to dates. I'm not a news site. This hierarchical structure, URL structure, shows Google that, hey, this post title is relevant to an online marketing blog. Do you see how it's more semantically relevant? The old way, a post on, uh, today I published one on 27 SEO essentials uh, for blogging, right? And that post title is, if I did it in this old way, it'd be like, all right, well, that would be relevant to April 20th, 2017. That post has nothing to do with April 20th, 2017. Has everything to do with an online marketing blog. Oh, so Google's now like, oh cool, this is an SEO post. Oh, and it's from an online marketing blog, it's still relevant. You're not blogging about everything, your website's very relevant. And the, my search traffic went up. And I learned a few things, right? As I mentioned, it's all about uh, topical relevancy. The less folders you use, the better. And that, again, helps keep it towards the root domain. And when you're doing this, you also need to make sure you add breadcrumbs. A lot of people don't do breadcrumbs because I've tested this out a few other times to make sure it wasn't a fluke and I've learned a few things. So you need to add breadcrumbs. You need to make sure there's schema markup. You need to change all the internal links from the old URLs to the new ones. So you can't just 301 your URLs, but if an uh, internal link from one blog post to another one is using the old URL structure, you got to go through each blog post and update the URLs. You need to uh, do a 301 from your old URLs to your new ones, as I mentioned. And most importantly, you need to change all of these things at once. I've done this around six times now. Since then, every time I make these changes one by one, the search traffic never goes up. Every time, or technically it goes up and then the next week it goes down. But every time I make all the changes at once, the search traffic goes up and it sticks. I don't know why, but for some reason in Google's algorithm, they want to see you making a lot of changes at once. So that's it. And now let's get into some fun Q&A. And as you guys are asking the questions, I'll do my best in order to answer them, but show you stuff that I'm doing as well so you can see more and more. Okay. Amazing, man. Thanks so much. Let's uh, just put us both back on screen here, I guess. That's okay with you. And let's look at the questions. Wow. So what a great journey through uh, that traffic increase over that period of time. Amazing stuff. There was a ton of people in the chat uh, having awesome positive content, uh, com comments, asking lots and lots of questions. Um, so I'm just going to get started with some of the most upvoted ones. Um, Let's take it from the top. Now, we've noticed over the last four days that the audience is sort of spread out, beginner, intermediate, advanced. While I'm asking this question, I'd love to know what you consider yourself. Type it in the chat, beginning, intermediate, or advanced SEO. Uh, but the first question, Neil, from the audience is, the, and the most upvoted one uh, is from Diana. It's changed from the one that we previously talked about. Her question is, uh, what's the fastest and safest way to get a brand new website or a blog to rank on the first page of Google and how fast can I get uh, there following your advice? Sure, so it all comes down to topical relevance and what I found is, uh, can you still see my screen claim? Yep. So what I found is it all comes down to topical relevance. Um, Google likes ranking small mom and pops just as much as they like ranking the big dogs. So I'm going to give you guys an example, right? Uh, NeilPatel.com slash how to start a blog. And this is what I mean by topical relevance. It's whoever goes more in depth, like in other words, topical coverage, not relevant. Oh, looks like he got disconnected there. Just hang on. Looks like he's reconnecting. We'll just have him there. The seal. if you're watching, maybe you could create a poll, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. That would be a cool way to sort of calculate uh, who's in the audience. Uh-oh, we need Neil to, uh, 
to comment again. Neil, comment again. Hang on, guys. We're coming. <laughs> Let's see. Neil, comment here. Sorry, guys. I'm just uh, putting Neil back on the, the live stream here. Neil. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, uh, here we go. So, Neil's just refreshing um, uh, his browser. But until we get there, looks like there are a bunch of intermediates, a bunch of... Uh, beginners and a bunch of advanced, which is pretty cool. It's interesting to see the top um, voted uh, question out of everybody's questions. What would you do if you had to uh, do it again? Let's see. Vasil, can you um, maybe call Neil on the phone and make sure that he's refreshing? And then we've got a bunch of other ones uh, from Craig. Uh, a couple from Craig. Wow, Craig, you've really got good questions. It looks like yours are getting a bunch of upvotes. Uh, there he is. Let's invite Neil again. Um, yep, we'll do. <laughs> okay, there's Neil again. Let's see if he's going to get added. All right, so we were talking about uh, topical relevance. We were answering um, Diana's question. What is the fastest and safest way to get a brand new website uh, to rank on the first page of Google, and how fast can you get there following Neil's advice? Um, let's see. He's not there, but I think he's, he's trying to connect now, so just hang on. Hold on one minute. We've got the Crowdcast guy working on it now. Didn't accept. Okay. Invite. Here we go. All right. Now I think he's going to be joining us. I was able to successfully send the invite out. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with us. Sometimes technical issues happen, as I'm sure you know, and we've got a ton of people that have been joining us on there. I just wanted to remind everybody while we're waiting for Neil to uh, join us that we've got um, a couple of... There you go. How are you? Hi, where are you guys listening? I was going to Abraham Lincoln. Did you guys see the Abraham Lincoln stuff? No, we just saw the, uh, the, the, ho the Google homepage. Uh, that sucks. Time uh, to answer the question again. <laughs> All right. Uh, it is loaded one, so... <laughs> All right, so the best way to increase your ranking is purely through topical uh, depth, right? Topical relevance, going more in-depth on a post, right? So you can still see my screen? Yep. All right, so here's what I mean by this. On my how to start a blog page, I cover how to start a blog, picking blog topics, um, all the way to choosing a domain name, hosting, uh, blogging platforms, like think about, it. I'm covering WordPress.org, .com, Blogger, Tumblr, Medium, Ghost, who, who the heck uses Ghost, you know what I mean? Like, that's how in-depth that I went to increase my rankings from page 3 to page 2. And it works on everything, like have you heard of the Abraham Lincoln example? No. <laughs> Alright, so Wikipedia used to have an Abraham Lincoln page that was only like four or five thousand words, their rankings keep sh uh, uh, shooting up because that page just kept getting more and more detailed. Like they cover everything, right? They probably even talk about his beard. Like this page, as you can see, I'm like continually scrolling. It's never ending. I'm like now halfway through the page. That's how in-depth that they go. And because of that, Google's like, all right, we should rank this page higher. Now, to give you an example, let's say you have a pizza shop, right? And you want to, you're in New York City, pizza shop in Manhattan, you're talking about the best pizzas and you want to rank for all pizza terms in New York City. If you start talking about how you make a pizza, the difference between New York water and Chicago, 
water and how that makes the dough taste different, how you preheat the oven, um, the best times of the day to eat pizza, what they go with. Does it go with red wine, white wine? Uh, what kind of toppings? Should it be market fresh? How you make the best tomato sauce or pizza sauce or whatever you want to call it? How much chili flakes should you ideally place? Like, without reading the flavor. Like, you're going so in-depth that everyone's like, wow, this is amazing content. And I found that when you're a new site and you don't have as many backlinks but you are way more in-depth, Google skyrockets your rankings eventually to the top. What I mean by that is like they start, you'll start seeing jumps so you'll go from like page five to page three or page 10 to page five, five to three, and then you'll slowly start climbing and you go from page three to page two. You'll be at bottom of page two and jump to the middle of page two, etc. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, I've got Craig asking, so speaking of niches and starting out, any advice for somebody that wants to put a, a new site in any random niche? Do you have some favorites or any advice there? All right, so I'm loading Google Trends. Here's how I pick a niche these days. It's purely through Google Trends. So it's loading. You still see my screen? Yep. So pick the biggest niche that you can find that doesn't have marketers. Like when we started that nutrition blog, Mike and I, um, and he was a nutritionist or a nutrition person because I didn't know anything about nutrition. It's so much more popular than marketing or like, uh, so let's say I go nutrition as a topic. It appeals to everyone and I'm competing with blogs that don't know very much about marketing compared to let's say I go in a niche like marketing. marketing right like look at the comparison nutrition versus marketing it's more popular by quite a bit and there's no competition so what I mean by that is there's no competition compared to marketing Right, you're not competing with other marketers. So pick niches that are big, like a subset of nutrition, and don't go after uh, like weight loss. Go after stuff that is up and coming, new, edgy, but stuff that isn't breaking down like uh, that all the marketers would go for. Marketers will go after weight loss supplements because they know they can make quick bucks and be affiliate marketers. Marketers won't go after something like green tea, yet green tea is really popular. Like, let's go look at green tea. Green tea. Right? So if I quit green tea, it's probably decent. It's a subset of nutrition, tea, healthy drinking, etc. And you don't compete with too many marketers. I used to rank on page one for this without building any links on a brand new nutrition website just because we had a nice article with pretty images and it wasn't even that thorough. I feel like there's going to be a lot of people starting websites in the T niche now. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure you guys give me a cut of whatever you make. <laughs> All right. Craig, uh, with 59 up folks, is asking, what's the number one tool that you can't live without? And if it's not one, maybe give us a couple. Yeah, there's two. So the first tool that I love using is SEMrush. And I'll show you the main way I use it. I just plug in my competitor URLs here. So, so it's loading. I gotta log in. It's all right. We would love to see how you set up your SEM rush, so we're happy to wait. It's pretty basic. Yeah, they, they have a lot of cool information, especially in the projects section. I don't even know my username and password. Let's go back to the home page. Uh, let's see if SEM Rush is watching or if they can give us a... Uh... Oh, no, I have a username and password. It's just saved on the home page. For some oh. reason, you click login from that. Okay. Cool. Cool. When I click login from here, the yeah. password should pop up. Yeah, that's the browser, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Login. See? Now I want to know, what about black tea and white tea? <laughs> <laughs> Old tea niche is being saturated today. <laughs> Teas make good money. 
I know someone who makes a few hundred thousand a month in profit selling keys online. Really? Wait, I think I heard you talk about that once. Are they, what, like a drop shipper or what are they, is it like special? Yeah, it's a young guy. I think he's like in his uh, late 20s. He didn't want to create his own tea products, so he just sells others and he doesn't want to deal with inventory, so he gives someone else a cut to deal with it all, like a drop shipping company and sells someone else's product and white labels it, but yeah. So here's SEMrush. I put in a domain like Moz, and what I really care for is top paid keywords. Because, and I, I look at this every single month in SEMrush because I want to see if it changes. See, companies in general don't spend an arm and a leg on pay-per-click unless they know it's converting really well. And let's go to full keyword report. And we'll show literally every single one of the keywords that companies like, let's say, Moz are paying for. Which is amazing because if I'm trying to rank for the, some of the same keywords and I don't want to spend the pay-per-click cost, um, I know that, hey, these keywords in priority tend to be the best. Now, I know I'm not going to rank for Moz that are named, but good keywords, and I look at the volume, SEO, SEO keywords, Google algorithm update, uh, keyword tool, keyword tool. Uh, let's see, these are actually the same. I don't know why I show the price. Oh, two different pages. Uh, Moz SEO, Open Site Explorer, that's their product. Technical SEO, that's a good keyword to bid on. Um, and I look at continual variations, Google SEO, free SEO tools. So I'm looking at all this stuff to determine what I should end up putting and what I shouldn't put on the page to, or within my web pages, within my keywords, within my copy, to figure out, you know, should I be going after these keywords. And that's since I'm using the paid data to figure out which organic keywords aren't just going to drive traffic, but convert. Because if someone's spending a lot of money, because they give you estimated CPC, like local SEO, $12.43 per click, must convert really well. doesn't matter if the volume is lower. It must be an amazing keyword. So because of that, I'll go after those keywords within my blog post due to the fact that I know that, hey, eventually those visitors are more likely to convert into customers. Then the other report that I use on SEMrush, so after, let's say, I put in moz.com, is this one here. Bless you. Thank you. I'm like, I'm getting sick, too. I'm like all bundled up inside with a blanket, and my heating turned on to 80 degrees. Oh, God. Yeah. You're getting a lot done. Yeah, I'm so productive. Like, even when I have a fever, I still work. There's no excuses. It's the best time to work. It's not like we're digging dishes here. Yeah, exactly. All right, so I'm scrolling. This is Moz that you're looking at? 594,000 backlinks? Yeah, this is on SEM Rush again. I ignore all of this. I don't care about that. I care about the most important part is top paid keywords by far. That'll tell you what keywords you should be targeting. And then I do the same thing for all the main competitors. So then I'll go from spy food to SEMrush to optimizing because they show like the competitor level, how, uh, how close they are relevant to Moz. And I look at all of their keywords and I start copying them as well. And I look for similarities because if all my competitors are bidding on the same keywords, that tells me that that keyword must be converting. They all can be dumb. If SEMrush, SpyFu, and Moz are bidding on the same 20 keywords as their main one, I know those are the, probably the most lucrative ones in the space. And that's what I try to go after organically. Absolutely. And one other tool you said. Yeah, the second tool that I use a lot. And I use these tools probably on a daily basis. So it's Ahrefs. And I tried buying the other day Search Engine Watch, right? My business dev guy, Andrew, hit him up. And we couldn't even get to offer. I was willing to pay two million bucks for it. But this website, and here's why. I can see over time that their traffic just tanks. They suck. Because it was founded by Danny Sullivan, or he was part of the team. I don't know how it worked. He's doing an amazing job. And over time, their search traffic has just tanked. Right? Like, look at the organic keywords. It just keeps going down. Like, they're just, the guys who bought it are doing jack shit with it, and they've owned it for years. 
So I'll go into Ahrefs, I'll type in a URL, like all my competitors, and I go into top pages. That's the main feature I use, it's not the backlinks, it's the top pages and the left sidebar. That tells me what pages are driving all their traffic, and then I go create similar content on my site. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if I go and click on this URL, I don't mean to do that. There you go. When I click on the keywords, not the URL, it shows me all the keywords that drive the traffic in order. Search engine, search engines, best search engine, alternative search engines, etc. Uh, search sites, internet search engines, better search engine than Google, unfiltered search engine, right? This all helps me determine what pages are driving my competition the most traffic and the keywords. So that way I know what type of uh, content to create and I make sure I include all these keywords within my content. And what I do is I just export them, right? And then I go into Microsoft Excel, start export. All right, I'm going to load this for you guys so you can see. load in here do you see it yep yep so that's a trick question how do you see it? I don't even see the X CSV file <laughs> oh, oh see the CSV file oh, see the screen there it is I like you sleeping on me claim right. so now I know all the keywords that I need to include in my content I usually just take the top hundred okay so then I take the top 100. There's usually duplicates, and I remove the duplicates, and I remove the misspellings, and I'll take the top 100 after I remove misspellings and duplicates. And then I integrate them within my content for the page that I want to rank. And I find that it helps me drive amazing search traffic. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Anybody that uh, is wondering about tools in this sort of category uh, that do similar things, got SEM Rush. And Ahrefs, people are asking a bunch about SpyFu and SerpStat and stuff like that. Uh, I use SerpStat. I have a really special deal with them. I pay uh, for one of their APIs. Um, and with SerpStat, uh, the data is just not as good as SEMrush. Um, I pay SerpStat thousands a month. I don't know what the number is. I think like 2500 five grand or whatever it is. Uh, it's not a bad tool. I, I like it. The data is just not as good as SEM rush. Okay, cool. My neutral viewpoint, right? So you can yeah, I totally agree. You know, these guys are awesome. We got uh, a bunch of insight from Marina, their president, a couple of days ago on what the trends are after collecting so much data. Uh, so SEM rush, absolutely. For me, it's not even the trends or the data. Like, I don't really care what they do on their back end. What I like about SEMrush is they're a big company and they've been around longer, so they invest more into like data crawling. So like when I go to SerpStat, again, good tool uh, for the price. It's amazing, but I'm limited on regions as well. So like if I go to here, you can see Google United States, Bulgaria, United Ukraine, South Africa, pretty much it. Right. And again, I'm not trying to talk shit. I pay for the tool, so it must be good enough. Uh, uh, they're up, and up and coming as well, SerpStat guys. Yeah, they're up and coming, but if I go to SEMrush, and this is the reason I prefer it, the keyword data is way more, and they have data on pretty much every single region out there. So let's say I type in a keyword like, uh, let's go to their homepage. Oh, forget this. Yes. All right, it's forwarding me to the dashboard. Oh, well. So, uh, where is it? So, if I type in keyword analytics, it should be here. Overview. You see this? 114 more countries. I can get data on everything from UK, Germany, France, Brazil, Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, Australia. Right? Like they have data on pretty much everything. Now for Moz, they may not have data on 
you know, all these regions. But I can type in a keyword and I can get data literally on all these regions. That's why I use SEMrush. Yeah, well, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, Wes is asking uh, about site structure. What's the best site structure and strategy for a local service-based business targeting multiple cities? Any advice? Sure. So you get to hear me for a bit. And I do apologize because even I hate hearing myself all the time. Nah, it's good. We need these long answers. This is what we're all here for. Okay, so I've tested a lot of things with site structure. Uh, when you're a local page, a few things to keep in mind. One, make sure that your home page has the right keywords, right? Uh, so it's like Neil Patel title is like helping you succeed through online marketing. I mentioned online marketing there. I'm not trying to rank the home page. It lets Google know that this website is about online marketing and marketing and everything around that. Have a video, keeps the user metrics really good. Have some keywords in there, visitors, dollars, ads. Uh, then I talk about growing business, talk about who I am, which is related to the domain name, Neil Patel, right? And then I go into the main pages and sections of the site. I know this is a local website, but this works for local as well. Uh, and I can show you, I actually rank locally. So Neil Patel, I cleaned my address. Look at this. You got little cookies there, some cup of tea. <laughs> Is that what we get if we come over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get you that. Seriously, if you want to come over, I'll buy you that. And look, my hours of operation, 24 hours a day. There's no holidays. <laughs> Why didn't you name it something amazing? <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you name what? Why didn't you name it something else? The Fun House or something, I don't know. I actually don't want people to come. I was just experimenting and testing. Right? Of course. <laughs> okay, cool. Wes, I hope you got a link, link to your main sections. Okay. So once you link to your main sections, you have improve your knowledge, you know, or my blog, my podcast, a webinar, start a website, main pages. And really importantly, right? And then you have each subsection. This works for the same with a local site or not. Here's a blog page, link to all the blog posts. Let's go into blog post page. You have the breadcrumbs, right? As you can see, I'm linking to the categories. That's the ideal structure. Sidebar, this is very, very important. Most people don't think about this. This works really well for localized page sites too. Link to your most popular pages on all your blog and uh, category restaurant pages. It could be your most popular menu items, your food pages. Like look, I link online marketing here. You think it's a fluke that I rank for also online marketing on Google? Probably not. No. I'm number one, or number two with NeilPatel.com. Number one with QuickSprout, but eh, close enough. Either way, they're both my sites. Um, but you see, right? And both of them on QuickSprout too. QuickSprout.com slash blog. What do you notice here too? Look in the sidebar. What's that? A link to the guides, right? That's how I optimize my site structure. Uh, and then uh, really important, on localized pages, uh, make sure you cross-link within your menu or within your content, your pages. And then uh, on your contact page, I don't do this because I'm not really that localized, but have all your locations and addresses there. So that way you can claim up multiple listings within the maps. And then go submit to Moz Local. Got it. Okay. All right, Wes, I hope you heard all of that. If you didn't, you can replay this session. And for everybody else that asked a similar question about local rankings or site structure for local businesses, I hope that site architecture helped out a lot. Uh, let's move on. Adrian's got 23 upvotes with this next question. He says, the benefits of SEO are sometimes hard to explain to clients or bosses because SEO is so complex and often doesn't have instant results. How do you address misconceptions about SEO when you consult? So I don't really consult, so I haven't had to deal with this in a long time, but here, here's some ideas, right? Study, I'm sure. Yeah, case studies, testimonies, but let's go even further and let's assume these guys don't even have case studies and testimonials, right? So go sign up for a free, 
Go sign up for a free uh, trial of SEM Rush, okay? And then go type in your competition. Let's say your competition, and I'm going to use this as a broad example because it's easy for everyone to see. Let's say your competition is. You can give me a sec. Should I use Amazon or let's use something smaller? All right, so let's use. Who else can we use? What's a small site? I'm running blanks here, Clay. Uh, let's do Growth Marketing Conf. Okay, that's a conference. That's too small of a niche. Uh, we can do Growth Marketing Conf, which you actually want. But you guys don't really do any SEO or marketing or anything on that. Uh, blogging and stuff. All right, Growth Marketing Dot com. Yep. All right, let's try this out. So, so keyword, keyword overview, right? It's loading. No data. Sorry. Let's do a real thread. R E A L T H R E A D. It's a T-shirt company. All right. Much easier. Are they decent size? They don't have to be. Uh, yeah, in the industry, yes. All right. So what you want to do is you. How the heck? All right, let's go to domain overview. Realthread.com. It's pulling, it's pulling. All right, you can see this, right? Organic search, 7.1. They don't really do much paid search. They're not a good example. Um, let's pick Amazon, right? This one's easy to do, and you guys can see. So here's how I explain it to clients. We should have asked the audience. They probably could have given good examples. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no worries. Actually, we should have. But all right, let's use Amazon, for example, right? So as I'm pulling it up, they probably get a ton of organic search traffic. And they probably spend an arm and a leg on paid advertising. All right? So traffic cost, $19.3 million. Right? Organic search traffic? It also shows you estimates of these sites, the keywords they rank for, and traffic costs. SEM is estimating with all the sites what the traffic's actually worth. So like even if you go back to real thread, it'll show you what they think these keywords are actually worth and how much you would have to pay if you wanted to buy that traffic. Right? And it would show if you're a real thread, for example, that these keywords would cost roughly $13,000 a month. So you can show your boss and like, look, they're getting traffic based on the SEM rush data. A lot of people are bidding on these terms. That's how they know they're a good terms, they're profitable, and they're worth $13,000. So we should be going after them. So then, well, I had to sneeze, but it's not coming out. All right. So, and then, Oh, there you go. Bless you. We get like 300 bless you's every time that happens. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, I feel lucky when they do that. Yeah, you're, you're very blessed right now. <laughs> Actually, I really do feel like I'm so happy everyone's here and like learning and stuff like that, right?